right, so we're, we're uh, I'm back, and so we're going with thinking, reasoning, and problem solving. Our learning outcomes is to explain the concept of mental images, uh, discuss the process of how we categorize everything in the world, um, talk about how humans make their decisions. We can be very irrational creatures a lot of the times, and to explain how people solve problems. So, a mental image is what you have of an, is is what you store in your brain of uh, an object or an event. Uh, um, you know, for example, here we have using mental images for athletes to to imagine what they might do in a competition. Um, you can use mental images for like public speaking or what you're going to do for uh, an assignment. Um, you know, it's in your brain and you think about it, you imagine it, and then you can do it. You're more likely to, to complete your task if you are you practice it over in your mind. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing because mental images can cause people to uh, experience anxiety and worry. You know, um, for example, uh, when my son was a little kid, you know, when he was like uh, one or two years old, um, I know, and he was starting to eat, you know, food. Um, I had, I would worry about him choking on his food. I know, weird now, but and I, you know, I worried about it, and I would see it in my head. And then I imagine what I would do. Okay. And then one day he really did choke on some food. It was a, a plum. Um, and I got up, and because I had these mental images in my brain that I that that made me worry, I was able to do the Heimlich and you now pop right out. So sometimes you no know, mental images can be a bad thing because you worry. Sometimes it can be a good thing because they can help you prepare for the future. Um, concepts again is how we how we organize the world, how we categorize things. Um, for example, what like a bird? All right, we have a concept in our head about what a bird is. Okay, now think of an example of a bird. When I say, imagine a bird in your head, what's the bird that comes to your mind? And that is your prototype of that concept. For most people, it could be like an eagle or a robin or a cardinal. But the important thing is, there's some birds don't, that don't fit into your concept, don't fit into your prototypes of what a bird is, like a penguin. A penguin is a bird. But when I say, describe a bird to me, you hardly ever think of, of a penguin. And a penguin is does a master prototype of what most birds are. Um, algorithms is a way that we can solve problems. Oops, sorry. Where did I go? Alright. It's like, uh, if you give me a big giant keychain and you have about 50 and I have uh, keys to about 50 different doors and 50 different keys. Well, if I came up to a door lock and not know which key fit for an algorithm, I would try every single key before I found the right one. Okay? And that could take forever. But you're guaranteed a solution. It's just going to take a lot of time because you got to try every single key. No matter if it's your car keys, you still try it. No matter if it's just your locker key, you still try it. Okay, you try every single key until you find the right one. Heuristics 
a shortcut in the process. I know to get into my door that I do not need to use my car keys. Because I know right off the bat they won't fit. I know in order to get into my room and get it through the door, I don't need to try my locker key. I just know not to try these. So that's what a heuristics is. It takes less time, but it's more prone to error. Because sometimes I might make a mistake and bypass the correct key. Okay? So algorithm, you try every single one. Heuristics, you uh, you kind of have shortcuts that, that work. All right, problem solving. First, you got to understand and diagnose what the problem is. And that's harder to said than done. And then you generate ideas. And hopefully you come to a mean ends analysis, all right? Uh, you want to test it several different times and see if you come to the same conclusions. And then you have a judgment. You can evaluate the, the information. You can evaluate the data if you're doing an experiment, a psychological experiment. And uh, the idea here is when you're problem solving to, to remain as objective as you possibly can. Don't let your, sometimes your past experiences, your biases can get in the way into discovering what's really true. Um, and so you have to be able to make the judgments without um, letting your biases get in the way. Okay. Functional fixedness is the inability to see differently a use for something differently. Uh, for example, you know, a sock. This function of a sock is to put on your feet before you put on your shoes, right? Can you come up with 10 other different things to do with a sock? All right. Um, you know, you, you could do, I don't know, you can put marbles in it and make a new game where you toss it and try to get it into a basket, you know, 10 feet away. That's something you could use for a sock. All right. Functional fitness, fitness, functional fixedness is the inability to think of new ways to use something. If I was suffered from functional fixedness when it comes to socks, I would say the only way you can ever use a sock is by putting it on your feet. A mental set is using the same uh, method to do something every single time. For example, and this is a true story, in the Korean War, there was a paratrooper, right? a right-handed paratrooper, jumped out of the airplane, but he had a left-handed uh, parachute vest. Because of his mental set of how the parachute vest worked, he was not able to adjust and look for it on the other side with his left hand to be able to save himself because he suffered from a mental set. All right. All right. Uh... Languages, uh, how people use language, how people develop language. Um, there are stages in language. And learning language for human beings is something that we're all programmed to do, whether we're deaf or not. We are very social creatures. It has helped us survive throughout the eons. And to be able to communicate with other, other people is probably one of the most important things that we'll ever learn to do in life is ingraining us instinctively to be able to learn language. We start out with the babble stage. You know, you always hear when you're around little babies, you hear ba ma 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 da 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 and mom and dad get all super excited because he said ma ma or dada. No, no, baby's not saying mama or dada on purpose. It's just babbling. Okay. Maybe sorry, we ruined everybody's, you know special moment with the kid would say mama daddy, but that's that's the thing. They're saying da 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 ma 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 because they're babbling. They're just making vowel sounds, and all babies babble the same, no matter where on earth. They all say the same things. They babble the same way. 
the critical period is to be able to learn a language or a lot of things is a very early childhood. There's still a lot of development going on in the brain. And once your brain is developing and it's wired, it's hard to reprogram. And that's what therapy is for. Same thing for language. Um, it's very important to learn language early in life because it's effortless. It requires no effort. All right? Think of a Spanish class you went to or a foreign language class you went to. It's hard as an adult or a teenager. But when you're a baby, effort. No effort at all. All right, they just do it. Uh, telegraphic speech. Uh, I show a book. All right. Uh, they, it begins around two years old. You know, bad dog. Things like that. Overgeneralization. Uh, you know, they see a cow, but they call it a dog. You know. Um, stuff like that. All right. I got to hurry up again. Uh, learning theory to uh, to uh, the language development again. This is classical and operant conditioning techniques. Then, when we begin to learn language, uh, we are reinforced either positively or negatively negative, negatively to learn the language. All right, or punished not to when we don't speak in ways. And so through this theory, we believe, or not believe, but the uh, learning theorists believe that uh, we are reinforced by operant conditioning, classical conditioning, to be able to learn language. Most psychologists don't quite agree with this because, again, to learn language is instinctual. And what language you use will, will kind of dictate how you feel about the world. If you ever notice, like French, the Romantic languages, they have beautiful bridges, beautiful structures, but then you get into like German and very powerful German and they're more, you know, in your face kind of, uh, you know, stuff with bridges and you know, buildings, very powerful. Well, their language is very powerful while the French are very uh, romantic. Nativist approach, um, I got two minutes. Universal grammar, we all use uh, vowels everywhere we go. No matter what language you use, human language requires vowels. Um, and I gotta move on. So we have to be exposed to some type of language in order to be able to learn language. Sometimes we can actually see language being born right in front of our eyes. And there's a place in South America, I think it's in Peru, by the beach, and all these deaf people who were not didn't learn any sign language, can't really, you know, communicate orally with anybody. You know, they just happen to show up at the beach, and there's a group of them, and they made their own language. It is instinctual that they do that. All right, we don't, we cannot choose not to speak, or we cannot choose to communicate. We have to communicate somehow, some way. It is programmed. Like a bird is programmed to fly, we, bring, we humans are programmed to, uh, to communicate with one another. Uh, again, I was telling you about this earlier, the linguistic relativity hypothesis. Again, you know, the language that you use right, will a lot of times dictate the way you think. Uh, if you're somebody who cusses a lot, you know, F-bomb, F-bomb, all the time, well then, that will show up in your thoughts and will affect the way you behave around people. If you're angry in your thoughts, angry in the language, you'll be angry with your behavior. Um, so, I think that's all I have for. I only got a few seconds left. Um, Alright. Thanks for watching.